Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our fourth webinar exclusively for Moxie Charter Certified Training Centers. Um, I'd just like to give a special welcome to our, our newest uh, members, uh, Neo Endurance Sports and Fitness and uh, MSP Fitness are our newest training centers to, to join us. Uh, our presenter today is Dr. Andrew Coggin. I'm sure many of you recognize him as a thought leader in using power for cycling training and of course as the co-author of Training and Racing with a Power Meter. He's been looking at how the MOXIE results compare with results from other NEARS studies. Um, so, so that's going to be the topic of his presentation. Uh, if you have questions, uh, there's, a, there's a question panel off on the right side of the webinar screen. You can submit your questions by typing them in. We'll stop about halfway through the presentation just for a, a question break, and then we'll have a, a Q&A at the end. Uh, the presentation is going to be about 25 minutes long, and so when we add in the question time, uh, our goal is to be done by about uh, 11.45 or so, uh, just so you know what to expect. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Coggin, and he can take it away with the presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Roger, and thank you and Moxie for the use of the Moxie monitors. I've uh, learned some things, and it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, very interesting. Uh, I assume you can see my screen? Yep, it's up on the, it's uh, okay. working Very now, good. yes. Well, uh, in thinking about this presentation for today, if uh, you're expecting that I would tell people how to design a training program around the MOXIE data and how it could be employed, et cetera, uh, I hope you won't be disappointed because I think it's still uh, early days somewhat uh, for trying to answer those questions, or at least in any case, I'm just little old me uh, in that I'm doing experiments on myself with the MOXIE and trying to gain insight into my own physiology, but you all are actually probably the experts in applying it to multiple athletes and trying to leverage that information to benefit. So instead, I'm going to approach this a little bit differently and talk about the various experiments I've done on myself to try and really look at the accuracy, precision, sensitivity of the device, and then in the process, try and share a little bit about the physiology of exercise as evaluated using uh, near-infrared spectroscopy. So at least you'll hopefully come uh, walking away a, a little more informed about uh, the background uh, of the physiology, and at the end, I think you'll also come a walking away, at least I, I did after all this playing around, uh, with a lot of confidence in the, in the MOXIE monitor. Now, just in general, I thought it might be useful to talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of near-infrared spectroscopy, which is a technique that's been under development since uh, way back when I was in grad school, so now more than 30 years ago, and at the time, it was sort of black box, hard to believe sort of stuff, and now we've advanced to the point where you have small, portable, consumer, uh, affordable type devices, so it's pretty, pretty uh, phenomenal in that regard. Uh, aside from reading about it, though, uh, I never had much uh, or any experience actually using it in my own research until getting the MOXIE monitors, so this has given me a good excuse to dig even deeper into the literature. Um, the advantages of near-infrared spectroscopy, of course, uh, that it are that it's non-invasive, it's real-time, uh, it measures something that's very important to muscle function during exercise, and that is the amount of O2 that's available in the tissue. Uh, one of my favorite uh, pet sayings is, uh, it's an aerobic sport, darn it, uh, with respect to uh, at least competitive cycling. So oxygen plays a very key role. And then I think you could, as I alluded to, and specific to the MOXIE, you can talk about the fact that it's, uh, it's now reached the point where it is portable and affordable. Uh, so we're moving it out of the uh, research realm and into, or it's moving out of the research realm into the uh, practical, the, the applied uh, area. The disadvantages to near-infrared spectroscopy, and this is not uh, specific to the MOXIE monitor in any way, in fact it uh, overcomes or attempts to overcome some of these, but the things that are, are always acknowledged when you read review articles, uh, number one is that the absolute quantitation of the amount of uh, oxygen in the tissue can be challenging. In the early days, people would do experiments such as uh, apply cuff ischemia, 
wait till the signal decreases as much as it possibly can because there's no uh, blood reaching the muscle and then call that zero. And then they'd have the person breathe 100% oxygen and let the signal increase till it plateaued at the highest and they'd call it 100% and they'd scale everything in between. Uh, other groups or other studies, they you know, decided that was just too much work and they simply report the data as a, a tissue saturation index or a TSI. So basically a tip of the hat of the fact that we're, we've got a relative measurement here and not necessarily an absolute one. And of course the, uh, the unique aspect of the MOXI monitor is using a mathematical algorithm to try and uh, achieve absolute uh, values without having to go through these additional lengths. Um, a disadvantage, another disadvantage of near-infrared spectroscopy is the limited depth of sampling. The light penetrates about half the distance or the signal arises from about half the distance between the two optodes. And so with a small device like the MOXIE, if you put it on a lean athlete, uh, you know, it works just fine. But as I've learned uh, in using it for what it's not intended to be used on such as uh, obese subjects, uh, well, you may not even get the signal from the tissue um, of interest, that is muscle. Um, so. Again, not a criticism of the MOXIE because I'm pushing it for things that it's not really intended to be used, but a general limitation of near-infrared spectroscopy. And then the, the one that was uh, really the most difficult for me to wrap my mind around uh, was what is it you're actually measuring? Um, you know, there's some debate in the literature still whether this signal arises from uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin versus oxygenated and deoxygenated myoglobin it's, uh, or you know, uh, some combination thereof. Uh, but the other part of it is that what you're measuring is the content which reflects the balance between delivery, i.e. blood flow, and utilization. Uh, and so sometimes it can be a little bit difficult, and I apologize with my phone there in the background, it can be a little bit difficult to interpret the data. And where it was really uh, uh, caught my attention and I finally really understood what was going on is when a colleague was using NERS to look at uh, patients uh, with a neuromuscular disease that led to an excessively high blood flow relative to O2 utilization. So while normally muscle O2 content goes down during exercise in these individuals, it actually went up. Uh, so it was diametrically opposed and that's when I really started thinking about, okay, what are we, what are we measuring here? Um, now there are, of course, alternatives to near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, we don't use it much in research here, but we do have uh, experts who actually use magnetic resonance imaging to look at muscle oxygenation. So this is actually my uh, calf uh, at rest and during exercise. The top panel is uh, perfusion or blood flow measured using arterial spin labeling, and the bottom is the oxygen extraction fraction uh, measured using a, a method developed by my colleague Jay Zhang. And uh, basically why I wanted to show this because what it demonstrates is sort of the heterogeneity uh, of oxygen uh, utilization in different parts of the tissue. Um, so you know, an advantage of uh, this technique over NERS is the fact that you can look deep within the muscle. Uh, the disadvantage is you need a $3 million magnet and you can't go anywhere with it. Uh, but I will come back to uh, some of these uh, experiments uh, in a little bit or at some point in the talk here. So when I first got uh, my hands on the MOXIE devices, uh, yeah, first thing I did is I slap it on my forearm and said, oh look, I'm getting a signal. And I asked my son to squeeze my biceps as, as tight as he could. And even though his hands are not big, he's only nine years old, my biceps isn't very large. So he was able to apply cuff ischemia and you could see the signal would decrease. And then I would say, hey, let go. And you could see it, you know, rebound and it would go up above as you'd have uh, reactive hyperemia. Uh, so I did a few sorts of, you know, fun experiments like that, but then started saying, okay, uh, how would you actually use uh, such a tool uh, for uh, training or testing if you're an athlete? And the first application that uh, comes to mind quite often is uh, to try and determine maximal lactate steady state or the metabolic control limit. So this is uh, uh, one of the early papers, uh, and you can see the, uh, the NERS device they were using you know, quite large, not portable, uh, the sensor trapped 
sorry, taped to the runner's calf, and it's not even wireless here. Uh, but in fact, with increasing exercise intensity, you have a nonlinear change in uh, muscle oxygen content. And so it's possible to try and identify a breakpoint or a threshold, which in multiple studies have demonstrated associates with uh, maximal lactate steady state. Uh, the second ventilatory threshold, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I wanted to see if I could replicate those kinds of things. So first thing I did is I taped the uh, the moxie to both thighs, and I did an incremental exercise test on my my uh, trainer ergometer in my basement. Uh, but I made the mistake of taping them onto my thighs and then trying to push the buttons to turn them on. And in fact, I didn't push the one on the right leg. Uh, hard enough, long enough to turn it on. So at the end for this experiment, I only got data from my left leg. Um, and what you can see is uh, with increasing exercise intensity, the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin increases in a nonlinear manner. And again, there's some controversy in the literature as to the best way to mathematically represent this data. A number of people have been modeling it as a sigmoidal response. But others say, no, you get a better mathematical fit if you do a, a two-point regression here, which is what I did. Um, and so at least from this single experiment, despite the uh, funkiness going on down here, uh, uh, objectively it detects a NERS threshold of 230 watts, which corresponded at the time with my fitness at the time. Uh, I think the WKO4 mathematical model had me at like uh, 227 watts or something. So I was like, ah, that works, that's cool. So then I said, let's repeat the experiment um, eh, multiple times because I wanted to try and see you know, what is the test retest reproducibility. And the other thing I was interested in was left-right uh, differences. Uh, I crashed when I was in my 30s, broke my hip, so I have uh, possibly as a result, my pedaling is asymmetrical as measured using the Garmin vector pedals, SRM, et cetera. Um, so I wanted to see if that was reflected in the physiological data. Um, and you can see I do have a difference in muscle oxygenation here between my right leg and my left leg. Uh, you can see that you know, this was actually uh, two tests in the same day, I believe. I'm not sure why I only have data for the right for one test. But you can see that the result response is pretty reproducible. Um, the blue and the orange for the left leg. Um, so it's like, okay, that's cool. Let's keep going. Well, then I did another experiment. Um, and this is two tests in a single day, uh, only on the left leg. And you can see during one test, I got a break point maybe, kind of there. <laughs> but on the other tests, not so clear. And that got me wondering about uh, sort of day-to-day -day variability, because if there is heterogeneity within the tissue in terms of muscle oxygen content, which we know there is, uh, then exactly where you position the sensor on the, on the skin can contribute to uh, variation. And even though I have some nice muscle biopsy scars to try and use to you know, guide my, my placement of my sensor um, or sensors, uh, I'm not necessarily putting it in the exact same place each time. So that led me to start thinking, you know, this, this uh, possibility of imbalance between one leg and the other got me to thinking about um, differences between different muscle groups and where should I place the sensor and dug this paper up out of the literature in which they did uh, NERS on the vastus lateralis, the open circles, the rectus femoris, the gray triangles, and the vastus medialis, the black squares. And what you can see is while you get this sort of uh, tipping over here of uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin, and again they're normalizing their signals, so it's uh, you know the basal value and the highest value, so it's normalized. Uh, they actually had a different pattern in the rectus femoris. They also collected EMG for these different muscle groups. And what they demonstrated was that they, when they expressed the uh, muscle oxygen or deoxygenated hemoglobin relative to EMG activity, you know, at first there's some changes, but from very low work rates on, 
muscle oxygenation was simply proportional to muscle activity, which actually makes a lot of sense. At least in healthy individuals, muscle blood flow is very tightly regulated by multiple signals um, to try and match oxygen delivery to O2 demand within the tissue. So what you're seeing in part when you see variations in uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin is actually changes in patterns of recruitment. Well, that got me to thinking about, huh, well, what muscles should I monitor? What muscles could I monitor? How do all my different muscles respond to increasing exercise intensity? So this is the result of multiple experiments on uh, a couple different, several different days in which I would do an incremental exercise test uh, starting at low work rates and going up to about 25 watts below total failure. And I kept leaving the, the one MOXIE monitor on my left thigh every single time. And then I would move the other one to different muscle groups. And the reason I stopped 25 watts before failure is I could do like five incremental exercise tests in a, a one hour session. Um, it was a good workout. It was also kind of entertaining. Um, in doing so, what I was hoping to get at was, you know, sort of, again, to be able to calculate what is the variability of trying to identify a breakpoint from my vastus lateralis data, and then at the same time also see how other muscle groups are responding. Um, I went so far as to look at uh, your, this, your lumbar muscles, so back muscles here too. Uh, you can see the general pattern is that the primary drivers are decreasing even from relatively low exercise intensities, where other muscles like the back muscles, et cetera, maybe they don't start to really come into play until the power gets high enough. Um, but it was, it was entertaining. It gives you a, a flavor or a feel for uh, differences in recruitment in different muscle groups. Um, Still, if you're a cyclist, it remains logical that you're going to pick the vastus lateralis as the most likely muscle to monitor. Uh, and whether uh, maybe I'm not a hip cyclist, maybe that's why my gluteus maximus didn't uh, show a decrease in saturation, uh, or maybe it's because, you know, I got more fat on my behind than I do on my thigh, <laughs> so that the signal is just higher, because uh, less is coming from muscle, it's hard to say. Um, <clears throat> but I introduced this so you can think about recruitment. Uh, using the MOXIE to look at how are you recruiting your muscles. If you're a bike fitter, for example, and you tweak somebody's position, uh, does it change the, the relationship of different muscle groups? Uh, where the experiment didn't pan out was in trying to look at that breakpoint in that when I objectively analyzed just the vastus lateralis data, sometimes I could uh, find a breakpoint and sometimes I couldn't. Uh, so it wasn't really possible to talk about, you know, what is the reproducibility of the breakpoint? Because sometimes it wasn't even detectable for whatever reason. Um, uh, the so Carter, at this point, I uh, it, changed my my approach. Uh, yes. the, yeah, could I jump in here and just see uh, if anybody uh, has any questions? Um, uh, I've got one. If I could, sure. uh, if I, it's more of a technical question. Yeah. When when you do the uh, MRI measurements, are you measuring? the dissolved oxygen, the PO2, or are you measuring the hemoglobin, uh, the oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin? It's actually uh, measuring the oxygen extraction fraction. It's the, it's the O2 susceptibility of the protons on hemoglobin. I mean, it's oh, proton okay. spectroscopy. Um, okay. Okay, so you, so it is so it's a hemoglobin type measure. So it is it's, in that sense, it's the same as the in the moxie. Yeah. The moxie is a it, only actually, so, so it would really actually be the combination of deoxygenated and oxygenated forms. Okay. Uh, of the hemoglobin. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I I am you know my name's on the paper, but <laughs> I'm not an MR expert, so. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Okay. I apologize for catching me out here. <laughs> oh no, no, that's. I was just. It was more of a curiosity. I was just uh, yeah. curious on because there's always the yeah. issue of the hemoglobin dissociation curve and. Right, right, right. Yeah. Sometimes you want to know the dissolved, and, and of course you don't really know that with the moxie. But um, we don't have any, we, we don't have any other questions uh, in the in the inbox here yet. So um, I'll, uh, again, I'll invite anybody to uh, submit your questions by typing them in, um, and then uh, uh, just go ahead again, uh, Dr. Coggin. 
Okay. Well, at this point, I changed my approach a little bit to try and uh, pick up threshold or whatever you want to call it, uh, with the, the thinking being that uh, you know there's a temporal aspect as well here that may be overlooked in an incremental exercise test where you're only at a particular power output for one minute at a time. So at this point, I started doing experiments where I would warm up for five minutes. That's why I the data doesn't start, start until about that point. I would ride at a steady power uh, for 50 minutes, and then I'd you know warm down for five minutes. So I could get in my hour workout in the day, and I could collect some data at the same time. And I started doing that at different power outputs, with the uh, expectation being that if I am below my metabolic control limit, my oxygen consumption, my efficiency or economy will remain constant. My blood flow will remain essentially constant, uh, and hence my muscle oxygen content will remain essentially constant. But at some point, you exceed that metabolic control limit, and you can no longer maintain a steady state with respect to oxygen consumption, in which case my muscle oxygen content should decrease over time. Um, so I started, I jumped around in different power outputs to avoid any ordering effect, but uh, I went at 225, 235, 245, 255, 265 watts uh, for either the 50 minutes or as long as I could handle it and collected data. Um, and here's really the sum, summary of all of that. At these power outputs, I could maintain it for the full 50 minutes and the slope from five minutes to the end of the 50 minutes uh, in terms of the uh, deoxygenated uh, form of hemoglobin was not statistically significant from zero. Um, so no drift, just a nice steady state at those power outputs. This is uh, the functional threshold power calculated based on the uh, WKO4 model. And by the time I got around to doing these, my fitness had increased. This is uh, the functional expression of laboratory maximal lactate steady state, uh, VT2, you know, whatever you want to call that uh, parameter. Um, as soon as I exceeded that value, I couldn't hold it as long. It could only last, uh, what is that, not quite uh, 30 minutes. Um, but look what happens to muscle oxygen uh, over time. I get a steady drift upward in the deoxygenated form, which because you're collecting data, I think I had the MOXIE set at half-second intervals, so you have an awful lot of data points. Um, as a result, that upward drift ends up being highly, highly significant. And if I crank the power up even more, of course, you know, I don't last as long, and the drift is even more dramatic, orders of magnitude more dramatic here. Um, so, as it worked out, then, using this sort of test protocol, I was uh, able to quite readily detect the point at which I could maintain a metabolic steady state and when I could not. And then to try and push things even further, I mean, that's a 10-watt gap. It was like, okay, model says 250. I did 250 watts. And so you can see perfectly nice, constant, steady state over time. Um, so I was able, using the NERS device, to nail down my, my metabolic control limit to within a very narrow 5-watt range. Somewhere between 250 and 255 watts is where you know, the wheels came off. Uh, so at least with this test protocol, uh, very, very precise sort of data. Now, changing directions here a little bit, uh, we've been doing studies using beetroot juice as a source of dietary nitrate and looking at uh, physiology but also function with the notion that it may be a useful supplement for individuals with heart failure, the elderly, et cetera. Um, but beetroot juice uh, is a source or di of, of dietary nitrate which produces nitric oxide. And while nitric oxide does numerous things within the body, it's best known for being a vasodilator. So the question then becomes, uh, you know, does dietary nitrate uh, ingestion increase muscle blood flow? And then, you know, can you detect that using 
NERS and with the MOXIE monitor specifically. Uh, so here's, uh, here's a st recent study where they actually looked at uh, total cardiac output uh, in normal subjects either uh, without beetroot juice or with beetroot juice. Uh, and you can see, although a small increase in cardiac output, uh, it is statistically significant at uh, low to moderate exercise intensities. Um, and knowing that the vast majority of this blood flow is directed to the exercising skeletal muscle, this indirectly implies a uh, significant increase in uh, muscle blood flow. But it's not a direct measurement. Others have actually used dietary nitro, or sorry, dietary nitro, have actually used uh, NERS to look at muscle oxygenation in response to dietary nitrate ingestion. So here the uh, open circles are the placebo trial, the closed circles are the dietary nitrate trial, um, and uh, this is at 50%, at 70%, at 90% of max exercise. Um, and you can see, yeah, less of an increase uh, they're talk expressing it as a change, but the deoxygenated form of hemoglobin is lower following dietary nitrate, uh, implying uh, a higher oxygenation state. And nicely, they did EMG activity, which was the same, as you would expect, since the exercise intensity in absolute terms is, is the same. So you know that this difference in oxygenation is not due to differences in muscle use, but would it have to be uh, due to differences in, in either muscle uh, blood flow, i.e. oxygen delivery, or in oxygen utilization. And again, this comes back to what you're measuring with NERS uh, is really the balance between the two. I mean, you can look at changes in the total hemoglobin concentration as an indicator of blood flow, uh, but it's uh, an ind indirect indicator and still a static sort of measurement. So I wanted to see, well, that's cool. Can I detect it on myself? Off to the basement ergometer I go, <laughs> two hours after ingesting dietary nitrate, slap the nerves monitors on my thighs, uh, do an incremental exercise test. And I want to apologize. I've been flipping back and forth here between expressing the data as the deoxygenated form of hemoglobin, which increases with increasing exercise intensity, or looking at oxygenation uh, uh, which decreases with increasing exercise intensity. Um, <clears throat> so unnecessary uh, confusion. Uh, but as you would expect, if, if dietary nitrate increases muscle blood flow uh, relative to oxygen demand, then the oxygenation of the tissue should be higher. And in fact, it was higher at rest. It's higher during exercise, especially at higher exercise intensities which actually makes sense because the conversion of the nitrate to nitric oxide is enhanced at, under acidic conditions. So you would hypothesize a priori that it would be most effective at higher exercise intensities. And then you can see post-exercise uh, a rebound uh, even above the baseline value. So having done this on myself and trying to you know, convince NIH to give us uh, uh, some you know, couple million dollars in order to continue our studies of dietary nitrate in patients with heart failure. We got permission from our Human Resources Protection Office to use the MOXIE device in our research. Um, even though it's not FDA, it's non-invasive, it's perfectly safe. They had said, fine, go ahead. So we brought in uh, the next heart failure patient who was rather unique. She's a, a ex-Ironman distance triathlete who had a valve problem, had some valve surgery, um, and developed heart failure as a result. She's also a physician, uh, so she knows all about what her condition is. Uh, but she continues to uh, train and exercise, and despite having heart failure, has a VO2 uh, peak of uh, 50, low 50s. Um, so a rather unusual heart failure patient. Uh, but nonetheless, in her case, um, not much difference at rest, but again, a greater oxygenation state, uh, especially at higher exercise intensities, and a greater rebound. Um, so uh, at this point, it's like, you know, and I think I mentioned this to Roger, <laughs> it's like, well, you might have intended to make a research, or, uh, consumer grade device, but 
as far as I can tell, it's a research grade device. Uh, now we have gone on and continued to try and use the MOXIE in further studies and uh, the one limitation for those uh, applications is the fact that it's op optimized for you know, lean athletes uh, with the size and uh, packaging of it and this kind of thing. Uh, but as far as I can tell, if you've got somebody who's lean enough, then uh, it measures up with uh, anything else uh, that investigators might be interested in, in buying for thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, back to the overshoot, just to, to give you an idea here. Um, again, with, uh, with NERS, you're looking at prim primarily uh, the balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen utilization. These are back to those uh, experiments that I showed earlier with uh, magnetic resonance imaging and also magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And the experimental model here is uh, uh, calf uh, presses plantar flexion because that's about all you can do in a magnet. But this is my, uh, my muscle phosphocreatin levels uh, and their recovery uh, f between mild, moderate, and uh, more severe exercise um, where the increase in PCR is uh, going to be mirroring the changes in muscle oxygen consumption by the mitochondria. Um, this is the post-exercise recovery in perfusion determined using uh, arterial spin labeling, uh, the MR technique. And then this is an experiment uh, I did outside the magnet with the, the MOXIE device uh, looking at recovery of muscle oxygenation. Um, and it's not crystal clear here, but if you actually go in and analyze the data, what you see is that uh, muscle PCR a measure of mitochondrial respiration recovers quite rapidly with a time constant of around 20 to 25 seconds. Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact values here for me, but consistent with the literature. Perfusion, on the other hand, um, recovers more slowly with uh, a much longer time constant. So in the immediate post-exercise period, what you have is, if you want to think about it, you have an excess in blood flow relative to utilization. And then that's, if that's the case, you would expect that your muscle oxygenation would recover more rapidly than this, but not necessarily, you can't recover any more rapidly than this, right? Um, and that you should have a, a, a overshoot. Um, and in fact, that's what we found here, uh, that the time constant of recovery modeled off of fitting this curve was intermediate between these two. And as I was showing you in the previous slide, um, with the, at least we get this overshoot phenomenon. So just one more uh, piece of evidence uh, that the MOXIE is uh, telling you what you, know, you would think it should be telling you. Well, you may have noticed uh, in that earlier slide uh, with the NERS during exercise and dietary nitrate, uh, the title mentioned uh, cerebral blood flow. Uh, and they had actually done some cognitive performance tests during exercise in individuals. And down the hall here, our, optic, or our uh, optical imaging laboratory, they've actually uh, tied together a bunch of NERS sensors into a, uh, a hat, basically, that you put on your head. And they can do imaging of the muscle oxygen content of the brain, uh, much like you do with MR. Uh, and you know, it's the surface is the first two to three or four centimeters of your, of your brain, but that's actually where most of your mental activity occurs. So I then came across this paper where they were reporting, you know, not only that dietary nitrate increased uh, cerebral blood flow, but that they actually uh, improved, the subjects in there here actually improved in uh, cognitive testing. Um, this is, I think they had to uh, subtract backwards by threes. Uh, and you can see they could do more successful uh, subtractions when they had ingested beetroot juice than when they had uh, ingested the placebo. Um, it's like, wow, oh, that's cool. You know, everybody wants to be smarter, right? <laughs> so method or madness? <laughs> So Moxie as a brain oxygen monitor, I thought I'll just tape it to my forehead <laughs> and give it a whirl. 
And here are the results. Uh, I did this during a, a exercise uh, in which I alternated five minute periods of steady state power with five minute periods of 15 second on off uh, micro intervals. And th this is just a 10 minute segment uh, chunked out of that uh, hour long workout. But here you can see I've got you know nice steady muscle satur or sorry cerebral <laughs> saturation uh, or forehead saturation. Um, nice steady total hemoglobin myoglobin. Uh, but as soon as I start alternating the exercise intensity, every time the power goes up, the muscle oxygen tends to dip, and then when the power comes back down, muscle oxygen recovers. Muscle. I keep saying muscle, I mean cerebral, forehead. Um, and then you also see oscillations in the total hemoglobin, total myoglobin. And of course, you know, I posted this to Facebook and Roger immediately, you know, has to reach out and say, you know, uh, we didn't really design this to penetrate your thick skull, so we don't really know exactly what you're measuring here. And it is true, we don't know how, exactly how far it would penetrate into your skull. It could be that I'm picking up changes in, uh, temporal muscle, resting muscle blood flow with this approach. Uh, but I thought it was, you know, fun little experiment to do, and I'm nothing if not a mad scientist. Um, the overall takeaway message I want to leave, with you, leave you with is the fact that in every uh, little n equals one uh, experiment I've done on myself, the results I've obtained using the MOXIE have been as I have expected based on the scientific literature. So while you can't really validate uh, uh, the MOXIE in an absolute sense because there isn't really a gold standard, you couldn't even really compare it to another, you know, say research grade $10,000 NERS device and say this one's right and that one's wrong because they're different approaches. Um, so you can't really talk about absolute validation, but it certainly uh, responds exactly as you would expect it to. And I was, I was struggling with exactly how to phrase this last sentence here because from my perspective, aside from the, the optimization of the size for athletes rather than you know, other patient populations, um, I consider it to be a research grade device. So my hat is off to uh, Roger and everybody uh, for what they've been able to do and miniaturize into a quite nice little tool. And that's all I have for today, and I've managed to keep it under the time limit. All right. Proud of myself. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. That was an uh, excellent presentation, uh, uh, really fabulous data. It's great to hear you describe it. I've, I've seen this data, uh, much of it before, but it's uh, really exciting just to, to hear you talk about it. Um, we've got uh, one question came in. Um, uh, do you have any correlation to skin fold thickness with respect to the effectiveness of MOXIE with lean versus heavier people? Wondering at what point does fattier tissue and more specifics on thickness limit the use? I, I do not. I mean, I, other researchers have done that, and then they've actually uh, used the they've used the group regression to try and correct individual data. Uh, all I have is really anecdotal results in that when we have put it on people who are, uh, you know, their leg is more fat than muscle, um, you know, we get very little signal. Uh, so it's really, you're, you, Roger, are better positioned to speak to that end of things, I think, from the design and engineering perspective. Yeah, if from just uh, real quick, uh, we, we usually say about 12 and a half millimeters of fat thickness. So if you skin folded it, whatever, that'd be 25 millimeters. Um, and that's based on the modeling. You know, we can tell on the model uh, when when we're really just not getting much signal back from the muscle. But that, that's not like a sharp drop off. You'll still get a signal even with, you know, when there's more fat than that. But it just gets to be, you know, you start to really question, it, it, you know, exactly what am I measuring now? When it's less than 12 and a half, it works, works, seems to work, seems to respond like we expect in, in the vast majority of the cases. Well, on, on that basis, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but um, it, 
to some, in some extent, I want to blame you for kind of you know getting me addicted to NERS. <laughs> uh, so I've gotten I've gotten intrigued by it, and I start thinking about other applications, and I start saying it's like, well, if I were going to invest in a you know a NERS device uh, for research purposes, I mean there are some out there in which the distance between the electrodes electrodes. The optodes is adjustable, et cetera. Um, but I'm just curious, have you ever considered making, uh, I mean, obviously there's a desire to have the smallest package possible. Sure. But have you considered making adjustable ones or maybe different size ones? Or Yeah, yeah we, we have. It's, it becomes a, it, there's a design challenge of uh, ambient light sensitivity that we run into where okay. The, okay. The, the signal light becomes smaller and smaller, but the ambient light doesn't become smaller. Okay. Um, and so it's a signal to noise issue. And at 25 millimeters, things work really nice. You know, with the light shield, you can use it in sunlight. Um, yeah. But uh, it just, it's just uh, things become more challenging out in that space. And so for athletes, we didn't really see a need to be there. But definitely, the technology could right. be extended. Um, there, there's a, there's a limit where all that you can't get any light back, or you know, it's right. just too much to measure through. But but uh, definitely, we could could move in that direction with a more advanced model. Might that also impact? Uh, Battery life. I mean, would you need more power to drive? Well, we're, we're already we're already kind of maxing out the LEDs. So, um, uh -huh. Yeah, there there would be you, you could put more LEDs in. Yeah, it it, it would be um, it, that would be an issue as well with battery life. Everything just everything gets harder at the longer mm -hmm. distances. So yeah, battery life, noise, uh, electrical noise becomes more of an issue. The package size gets bigger. So um, it's kind of a okay. it's a balancing act. Right. Um, we've got one more question here. Uh, considering your experience with the Moxie, what are your feelings about FTP testing and WKO? Well, I'm a, I'm a nerdy scientist, but I also have a very practical side. One of my favorite sayings is, you know, the best predictor of performance is performance itself. Uh, as, as a cyclist, Hunter Allen and I were actually having this conversation just yes, yesterday. As a cyclist, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate, I'm spoiled, I'm jaded by the fact that it's, uh, for cyclists, it's easy to measure your power output, which is not only what drives you down the road, but also uh, largely dictates all of your physiological responses. Um, so as a cyclist, my go-to would, would still, to this day, be a power meter. Um, but I can see, you know, even for cyclists, how you could uh, use, potentially use NERS data to uh, look beneath the hood, not something that is necessary uh, in every situation, but could be helpful in some situations, or in other sports where measurement of power is uh, more challenging. Um, I think, uh, you know, it would be a matter of balancing the exact uh, testing protocol and optimizing it versus relying upon the my pragmatic approach of you know training is testing testing is training um, so and you know this is a similar to questions I get many times and I always feel like I'm waffling on my answers but the reality is that uh, it's so from my perspective I think these things are so context specific that it's difficult to offer absolute hard and fast advice. Uh, I, more I have to sit there and think of it in terms of, well, if I was in that situation, what would I do? But if I was in a different situation, I might do something else. Um, so. All right. All right, great. Well, we're, um, we're, we're uh, reached the end of our time here. Uh, just one, there was one other comment uh, came in e expressing admiration uh, of the photo of yourself with the Moxie on your <laughs> so I'll to share that. Um, but, uh, uh, I'd like to say th uh, thank you again for presenting this. It was uh, really awesome information, uh, very, very uh, thoroughly and well presented. Uh, uh, and there's a, a number of other comments coming in saying thank you. Um, so, and uh, let everyone know this uh, this recording will also be up on our on our uh, uh, forum uh, forum page. So, if people want to uh, review the uh, review the recording, that'll be available uh, soon. So, thank you again, and and uh, look forward to continuing to uh, to work with you in the future. All right. Well, thank you, Roger.